On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking with former NASA astronaut Franklin Chang Diaz about Vazimer, his revolutionary plasma drive that could propel spacecraft to Mars in just five weeks, as well as his amazing journey from a childhood in Costa Rica to NASA and beyond. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 80, recorded on September 22nd, 2023, Onward to the Stars with Franklin Chang Diaz. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by our friends IT Pro TV, now ACI Learning. IT skills are outdated in about 18 months. Launch or advance your career today with quality, affordable, entertaining training. Individuals use code TWIT30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership at go.acilearning.com slash twit and by Bitwarden. Get the open source password manager that can help you stay safe online. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise plan trial or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the as close to warp drive as it gets edition. I'm here today with the indestructible Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief at space.com. How are you today, Tarek? Uh, indestructible, apparently. I like that one. That's a good one. So Yeah, it's overdue. Well. <laughs> but more important than either uh, myself or Tarek, we're joined today by Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. So get ready for this list of accomplishments. MIT PhD, NASA astronaut, and among other things, inventor of the Vasimir Plasma Propulsion System, which uh, I could say with all due humility, I think, promises to revolutionize spaceflight. Hello, Franklin. How are you? Hello. Hello. It's great. Great to talk to you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I think for many of us, you're a person whose exploits we've been following for decades, and it's exciting to finally get to to say hello. So um, thanks for joining us. So before we yeah. begin, Tarek. Yes. Yes, Rod. I have a new space dad joke. All right, I'm ready for it. Lay it on. And I, and I wouldn't be saying quite what I'm saying unless it was something that I actually suffered from slightly, okay? Oh, so now you have to say it. Okay, I I'm ready. set it up. <laughs> hey, Tarek. Uh, yes, Rod. I'm somewhat dyslexic. When do you think we'll achieve rap drive? <laughs> so that was good. It's good. Okay, okay. And, and this isn't a joke, but it's in the humor department. <laughs> Thank you for the for the crickets. Um, did you know that a Northrop Grumman Innovation Systems office in Virginia is located in an industrial park on a small street called Warp Drive? No, oh, no, I didn't. And they're know. at four five one zero one Warp Drive, Sterling, Virginia two zero one six six. Huh. Nice. So send right. your, your cards and letters. <laughs> well, All right. I so. I was um, gonna say- I was going to say, right. now, now, now everyone Barbie. has their address and we can all go visit. So. Just a reminder to please uh, do a solid and like, subscribe, and so forth to our podcast because we love you as much as you love us. All right, let's get to some headlines. We yes. have asteroid bits incoming. That's right. Well, just just fresh off the uh, our, our, our episode last week when we talked to the folks from NASA's OSIRIS-REx, uh, we have, in fact, uh, the OSIRIS-REx landing Uh, coming up just this weekend as we're recording uh, this podcast. So, you know, of course, that's space.com. We're all all, uh, on top of everything. And so uh, one of the things I would like to point people to is that if you're wondering how it's going to come back to Earth in five not-so-easy steps, we've got all of that covered. Uh, But on Sunday, uh, September 24th at about 10 a.m., NASA is going to go live with their their big podcast. And the landing itself, and it's about, remember, it's a cup full of asteroid Bennu material uh, that is inside this kind of heat shield protected uh, uh, capsule. Uh, it's going to screech through the, the atmosphere, but it all starts four hours before. So before we're even awake, it's supposed to let everything go. The weather looks good for it. It's going to land out there in the, the, the salt flats of Utah at the, a, a military uh, army like weapons testing range. Uh, and the folks from NASA, they're out there now just getting, getting ready for it. And all, you know, all signs point to everything going Okay, but as Rod, you pointed out, uh, I think last week uh, when NASA tried to do this with the Genesis uh, mission, which had bits of Stardust it, it, uh, and uh, I think Solar Wind, if memory serves right, um, it did crash, uh, which was unfortunate. They were able to still get some of the samples out of that, which was nice. Uh, but when they did it with Stardust a few years later, that one went 
swimmingly and just as expected. And, and so it's, it's, it's 50, 50 so far for this one, but we're, we'll see because everything seems like it's on track, something like 24,000 miles, 26,000 miles on the way in. Uh, it's got this big drone shoot uh, and then a, a big parachute to uh, uh, slow itself down. It's going to hit the ground at 10 miles an hour, which isn't very gentle, but I guess, you know, it's like when a you're brisk walking pace. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so just, just, uh, you know, everything seems to be going on, uh, as planned right now okay. and we're just going to be watching for the weekend hopefully we don't have to wait an extra two years for it so i don't think i could do the soup nazi but no oriented for you so uh <laughs> you can land osiris rex in utah but apparently varda can't what's going on there that's right there's just kind of a it's a weird tie-in another like a new company varda space uh was going to try to bring its own capsule it's a private company uh and this month they had also hoped to land their um, their capsule from this kind of space manufacturing prototype uh, uh, that they had launched just a, a few a few weeks earlier uh, back to Earth, and the FAA said no, you cannot re-enter, even though they wanted to land in about the same place, right? And so it's an it's an interesting kind of take. I, I think maybe the proximity to um, uh, to Osiris Rex might have been part of it, but mm. as TechCrunch and also Ars Technica reported, uh, it's a fairly new and developing situation where they they said, okay, we're ready to come back. The FAA said, no, you don't get a reentry license, which I think, you know, even a few years ago, you know, uh, prior to SpaceX, no one would have thought right. that companies would need a reentry license. And, uh, and Varda Space, which is based in Salt Lake City, has appealed that decision. And so they're hoping that they're going to get uh, some more, some stuff or or take other uh, measures to track and and you know safeguard the reentry so that they'll be able to uh, uh, to proceed with their mission and their demonstration uh, so that they can uh, you know continue the work to you know build out in space manufacturing bringing that stuff that they make up there back to earth because you know you don't want to just build it and leave it up there if you don't have any any way to get it back to uh, to, to earth and then uh, and then they can proceed i suspect the fda is going to wait till at least after osiris rex uh you know is is complete uh before they revisit the license itself but it was a really interesting story from TechCrunch and arsenic and i thought it was a good tie-in for the the osiris rex landing this weekend all right well we wish varda the best of luck it's no fun to be stranded up there is there a, a some kind of forcing function that means they have to come back over the weekend or was it just the way they planned it well they were they wanted to come back actually much earlier in the month around september mm -hmm. early like the first week of september and that's when all of this was like really kind of filtering out and varda basically made some public statements uh in the last week or so that acknowledged that they weren't able to come in and their 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 thing is on appeal so it sounds like they can wait until they get the license to detach the reentry capsule and then try everything. But you know, you, you want to make sure that you know where your vehicles are, your satellites are so that you aim properly. Cause one of the things the FAA, you know, looks over and we, we saw this during the tragic Columbia accident is that flyover path. What, uh, what areas or communities or populated right. areas will this commercial, uh, uh, capsule be flying over? You know, when SpaceX lands, they land either at sea or at a military base or a, a spaceport. Uh, those are fairly controlled areas. Uh, landing in the middle of Utah requires a lot of land flyover. All right, Tarek, thank you. That's very good. And everybody stay with us. We'll be back after the short break with the meat and potatoes of our show, Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz. Stand by. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by our friends at IT Pro TV, now ACI Learning. Our listeners know the name IT Pro TV is one of our trusted sponsors for the last decade. As part of ACI Learning, IT Pro TV, now IT Pro, has elevated their highly entertaining bingeable short format content with over 7,200 hours to choose from and new episodes added daily. ACI Learning's personal account managers will be with you every step of the way. You can fortify your expertise with access to self-paced IT training videos, interactive practice labs, and certification practice tests. One user shared, excellent resource, not just for theory, but labs incorporated within the subscription. It's fantastic. Highly recommend the resource and top class instructors. And I could say that I've checked out this programming and having done some online training in the past and video, which was pretty dreadful, the stuff I saw from IT Pro TV was sensational. It was entertaining. It was engaging. It was well lit, well recorded. All the things we worry about on our podcast, they have excelled at. 
And it's really something that you can sit and watch for hours and hours at a time. Uh, make sure to not miss ACI Learning's practice labs, where you can test and experiment before deploying new apps or updates without compromising your live system. MSPs love it. You can retake practice IT certification tests so you're confident when you sit for the actual exam. ACI Learning brings you IT practice exam questions from Microsoft, CompTIA, EC Council, PMI, and many, many more. You can access every vendor and skill you need to advance your IT career in one place. ACI Learning is the only official video training for CompTIA. Or you could check out their Microsoft IT training, Cisco training, Linux training, Apple training, security, cloud, and more. Be sure to join ACI Learning on September 26th to the 27th in London at the International Cybersecurity and Cloud Expo to experience the latest innovations and cutting edge technologies. Learn IT, pass your certs, and get your dream job. Or if you're ready to bring your group along, head to our special link and fill out the form for your team. Twit listeners receive at least 20% off an IT Pro Enterprise solution and can reach up to 65% off with volume discounts depending on the number of seats you need. Learn more about ACI Learning's premium training options across audit, IT, and cybersecurity readiness at go.acilearning.com slash twit. For individuals, use code twit30 for 30% off a standard or premium individual IT Pro membership. That's go.acilearning.com slash twit. All right, we're back. So, Franklin, thank you so much for coming today. I think sure. I've already said that three times, but <laughs> just, I'm that excited about it. So, I think when most people think of your career, they think of seven space shuttle flights and, of course, Ad Astra Rocket um, and the fine work you've been doing there. But before we get into all that, I think your origin story is really fascinating and inspiring. And I, and I remember reading about you years ago thinking, this is too, th this is like, if you wrote it, people wouldn't believe it. They think, oh, <laughs> you know, they made this up. This is too good. This is too pure of heart. So if you could just kind of give us a rundown of how you got here from Costa Rica, because it's, yeah. it's a pretty amazing. I mean, the beats line up almost perfectly. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I think I am a child of the space age um, because, um, you know, I was seven years old when Sputnik flew and that was uh, uh, just an extraordinary moment, uh, you know, to, to the whole planet. And um, a lot of my uh, contemporaries, uh, my friends, my cousins, I mean, we all wanted to be astronauts or there were no astronauts in those days. They were, they were, we, we thought we were going to be space explorers. And, um, you know, uh, that was uh, 57. And then, then in 61, uh, the first uh, astronaut, uh, which actually was called a cosmonaut, uh, flew and became our instant hero for us, to all of us. And then, of course, subsequent to that, uh, the first uh, astronauts were uh, picked by NASA. And, and all of a sudden, they, they, there were people, real people, um, you know, blood and bones, um, who were real, real astronauts. And... Um, I wanted to be an astronaut. And of course, at the time, you know, when I would tell people that I wanted to be an astronaut, when I grew up, everybody chuckled and uh, it was, yeah. And my mom, being the clever woman that she is, said, well, but you got to study because astronauts have to, you know, have college degrees and you're not a very good student and you better oh, get no. your act together. So. So I said, yeah, I guess that makes sense. And that uh, actually worked. But, um, you know, I finished high school in Costa Rica and I graduated in 67. And, you know, I had a choice. I, 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 if I wanted to be an astronaut, there were only two places I needed to go. One was the Soviet Union and the other one it was the United States. The Soviet Union was a, you know, a strange place, mysterious, kind of dark. Uh, we didn't know much about him. And the United States was, you know, 
booming with uh, the space program and uh, NASA. And I wrote a, a letter to uh, Werner von Braun, who was, uh, <laughs> you know, one of my heroes. And I was surprised that I actually received a response. And this, this came uh, as a letter. It was a form letter. Probably NASA was getting lots of letters of wannabe <laughs> astronauts from all over the world, and I was one of them. And um, in that letter, which I still have, I still you know, remember the first paragraph, the last line in the first paragraph uh, said, um, careers with NASA are only available to U.S. US citizens. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I didn't speak English at the time, and, and I had the letter translated. Uh, so, and something got lost in the translation uh, in that what I understood they were trying to tell me was, uh, well, um, come over to the United States, become a citizen of the United States, and then you'll get, you'll get a job with NASA. <laughs> And so that's what I did. I, um, I left Costa Rica. I had uh, I had been working in a bank. I was a bank teller for a year, saved uh, $50, convinced my dad to get me a, a ticket to the United States. Uh, I had a family in Hartford, Connecticut that were willing to um, open up their, their home for me. And my, my father, in his infinite wisdom, <laughs> gave me a one-way ticket to, <laughs> to the United States because uh, he said, Franklin, you know, I know being an immigrant myself, I know how hard this is going to be. And if you have the, the return ticket, I know you will be back uh, at the first sign of trouble. <laughs> and, 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 and he was right. I tell you, if, if I had had that return ticket, I would have given up. I would have uh, come back. As it turns out, I had to stay and I had to figure out how to make my way and learn the language. Got, went back to high school, uh, learned English, uh, eventually was given a scholarship to the University of Connecticut and thus entered the university in 1969, which was the day, uh, the, the year where uh, when uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon and I, I saw that. And I tell you, that was it basically told me I am a little bit less far, you know, from, <laughs> from my goal. At least I'm at the, in the right country. And it was it was just a collection of activities from there on, you know, just working hard, working my way through it. I finished at uh, the University of Connecticut, went to MIT. Um, it turns out that. Um, you know, my professors at the University of Connecticut said, Franklin, don't even think about going into space because go, go to work for NASA because um, uh, you, won't, you won't get a job. Because in 1971 or so, just before I graduated, uh, the, the Apollo program was canceled. And there were thousands of, uh, you know, aerospace engineers out of work. Uh, many of them with PhDs, and, and, and they were out, you know, driving taxi cabs, pumping gas. Uh, and so I decided that uh, maybe I should uh, take a little detour. And I went into energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, there was an energy crisis in 73, which is when the Arab oil embargo occurred and, and there were lines, long lines at the pump uh, in the United States. And I decided to go into nuclear power, learn to uh, nuclear reactors, thinking that someday nuclear power would play a, a key role in space. And so on and so forth. You know, all, the, all the pieces began to kind of add together, ended up at MIT, went to work in the, the field of thermonuclear fusion which was uh, something uh, so futuristic that I almost forgot about the space program. And then in 1977, NASA unveiled the uh, approach and landing tests of the uh, Space Shuttle Enterprise. And it's just like it, the, the light bulb came up again. <laughs> and 
and I, uh, 1977 is when I got my, my citizenship. I became a citizen of the United States. And you can see that all of a sudden I had all the pieces <laughs> that were the requirement in, in that letter. And uh, sure enough, uh, uh, NASA sent uh, a notice uh, that uh, it was looking for a new class of astronauts. This one, this was uh, 1977, 78, and I was rejected oh. right away, <laughs> right, right away. Uh, but I figured, well, you know, I'm sure that they're going to have this again. And sure enough, two years later, NASA uh, sent another notice uh, to uh, U.S. Uh, candidates that um, it was looking for another group, a smaller group of astronauts to, com uh, to complement the, the, the other the group that had just been selected. I uh, dust off my application. I up updated it. I had been working at Draper Labs for uh, two and a half years. And, um, you know, I had a lot of more experience. And this time they called me for an interview and I knew that I had made the cut from, you know, 3,000 plus to about 120. And that, that began, started to get really interesting. <laughs> there's, like, there's like two points there that I think, Franklin, are, are very important. Number one, persistence and the de determination obviously pay off. Uh, and number two, parents are just wise, it seems like. With that story with your father, I'll tell yeah. you, and, and, and this is nowhere compared to your accomplishments at all, but my mother told me the same thing. I, I grew up in California. I went to school in California. And when I, I got my degree in, in science writing in New York, I was ready to go back to California and try and find a job. And my mother said, no, don't come home. You know, <laughs> don't, don't come home until you get a job. Well, because you're sure it'll be that's a lot for the same reason that Franklin's father gave I, him the one way ticket. I would hope so. Maybe she right? just didn't want you to come home. <laughs> but but it's a, it's a it's a really interesting interesting road that you mm. had there. And the one thing about about your path, you know, just prior to joining NASA, that I had a question about was uh, about your studies at at MIT because you mentioned about getting interested into energy. And I was curious what led you to applied plasma physics, which of course, you know, you were, you were studying there and uh, Vasmir is a, a plasma engine. I'm sure we're going to talk about that. And, and is that, was that an evolution then of your exposure to the, the, the nuclear and the fusion research that you had seen, uh, or was it something else that kind of sparked, uh, pardon the, the energy pun, no, uh, that, 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 <laughs> You know, uh, Tarek, I, I, I somehow always connected um, space with nuclear power. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that I was trying to understand, you know, how people would, would fly to Mars and, you know, fly to other, other places, recognizing that the, the, the chemical propulsion systems that we used, um, as good as they are, are not gonna are not gonna cut it. They're not gonna be capable of doing this. And so somehow uh, I was I was impacted not just by Sputnik. I was impacted a year later, in 1958, by the um, the submarine Nautilus mm -hmm. that was able to dive in the North uh, Pacific and reappear in the North Atlantic. And, you know, how did it do that? Mm -hmm. It just went under the North <laughs> Pole. And that there was no submarine that could ever do that. Uh, they just didn't have the staying capacity under, underwater. And so somehow I felt there was a connection there, that uh, nuclear energy would be fundamental for uh, space. And so that the detour that I took in, at the university was a detour that was not too far from what I really was interested in, somehow to marry nuclear power with space flight. And eventually that brought me into uh, thermonuclear fusion, plasma physics, again, nuclear, nuclear power, yeah. but the application to propulsion, to rocket propulsion, and then the Vasimir engine, which is what I've been working for the last 40, 
43 years of my life. So that that's a pretty astonishing number right there. <laughs> well, as as long as we're talking about Vasemir cuz I I do want to uh, talk about your career with the shuttle but uh you know, there's a lot of news coming out if you're looking in the right places about the new Draco demonstration engine they're going to build, which is nuclear thermal. And of course, you know, we had years and years of research with with Nerva and Rover before that. So nuclear thermal is familiar to a lot of our listeners, which mm -hmm. is, you know, promises on its own to mm -hmm. step up space flight within the solar system because it's got, I think, about twice the ISP of chemical. But Vasimir, if I understand correctly, promises to have about, what, eight times... The At least specific impulse of nuclear yeah. thermal, right? I mean, yeah. this is yeah. not a trivial. This is not. Oh, I'm giving you ten percent more than nuclear thermal. This is no. I'm going to blow you right out of the solar system. Kind yeah, of that's right. That's Can right. You discuss that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. That that to me, the the nuclear thermal uh, is a good step, but it is not enough. Um, I mean, I mean, if we really are going to go through the difficult transition to to, to, to get people to accept nuclear power in space, we need to get a big bang for the buck, you know, and that is nuclear electric. So nuclear electric to me is the end game. And it, it actually is, I, I believe, te technologically less difficult than, uh, than, than nuclear thermal. Because nuclear thermal, mm -hmm. Basically, the, the, the reactor and the engine are all together into one. They're all sort of integrated into one. And so it all has to work. Um, in nuclear electric, it, it is, there is a, an electric engine, which is what the Vasimir is. Doesn't care where the electricity come from, comes from. Then there is a power conversion system which takes the nuclear power and turns it into electricity. It's a separate piece. And then there is a nuclear reactor, which makes the heat that you turn into electricity. And so it's, it's an assembly of components and pieces. And when you think about it, yeah, you could say it's a lot more complex. Mm, maybe so. I mean, an internal combustion engine is very complex. And is, is, we have millions of these engines, you know, riding in our in our roads so um I, I really believe that the nuclear electric option is an easier approach and it gives you 10 times the specific impulse and if you are interested in going to high power now we're talking um, multi megawatts so multi megawatts of electric power will give you also the thrust. Mm -hmm. So you, you get the ISP, the specific impulse, but you also get the thrust. And these engines are operating continuously. You see, so, so you're always accelerating. Right. And, and so not only do you have a tiny artificial gravity uh, throughout the entire journey, but you just go, you just get there faster. I mean, <laughs> a lot faster. And, you and got your, you know, you've got your foot on the pedal the whole time. Well, so that's, <laughs> that's a, a really good point that I don't think we talk thing. about often enough, which is, you know, when you're talking about chemical propulsion, you're getting minutes of, of uh, acceleration at a time, maybe tens of minutes tops out of traditional conv conventional chemical engines. Thermo nuclear thermal and nuclear electric in this case is going firing for days, weeks, months at a time. But I, I'm just I'm trying to get my head wrapped around these numbers. So Vasimir, at least from that one test a few years ago, generates, is this right, at least 20 times what a chemical engine does and you're firing continuously? Yeah, Vasimir, what Vasimir does is that it, it doesn't have the thrust of the chemical engine mm. or the thrust of the nuclear thermal rocket, but it has a thrust that is continuous. Right. And when you, when you factor in the time, when you put in the time factor in there, the amount of energy that you deliver to your trajectory is much higher. And th that's why you, you gain. That's, that's why you win. It's, it's not so much because you get an impulse, a sudden you know, jolt of power 
you know, oftentimes astronauts, we, we often joke that uh, we, we travel on cannonballs, you know, <laughs> you know when we, we fly to the moon, we, we get a cannon fire, just kind of the, the, the same way uh, Jules Verne uh, sent uh, humans to the moon, we get, get a, a cannon to fire, and that gets us in a trajectory to the moon, and when we get to the moon, we have to fire another cannon to stop and then another cannon to get going back to Earth and so on. Well, here we are firing continuously. It's a more gentle approach, but in the end, you're delivering a lot more energy. And I would point out, just because we've been saying Vasimir a lot, Vasimir is actually an acronym for our yeah. listeners and, and, and readers. <laughs> it, it stands for, and please correct me, Franklin, if I, if I miss, misspeak, misspeak Variable specific impulse mag, mag, magnetoplasma. Is that, did I say that right? That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> rocket. <magnetoplasma>, so, rocket. <laughs> and, and, um, and just, just as, as, as you described, it's, you know, it's an electrically powered throttleable long life continuous thrust. And so that's, if, if anyone out there is familiar with like the expanse and how their ships are always firing their engines. And then when they want to slow down or stop, they flip over and decelerate. So they're right. accelerating. That's what this sounds like. It's a very sci-fi concept so that you've, you're always firing that, that, that engine. And it sounds super challenging, Franklin. You mentioned, you know, you've been working on this for, uh, uh, for, for the last, I think you said, 40 plus years. What's the huge, the big challenge? Is it just managing all of that energy uh, then? No, or, no. Or actually, you know, we say to people now that the difficult part is behind us but the expensive part is in front of us. <laughs> oh. So really the, the, the challenge before us right now is, fun, is, is, is funding. It, it really is financial. Uh, so we have done the experiments. We have done the, the, uh, the tests. We just finished uh, just a couple of years ago a, a long duration test, uh, probably the longest, uh, the longest that, that a plasma engine has fired at this power level. Uh, we ran uh, uh, for 88 hours nonstop wow. Wow. in our vacuum chamber at, uh, at full power, uh, 80 kilowatts at, uh, of the engine. And so, you know, we now demonstrate that the engine works, the performance works. Now we need to take this engine and take it into space and, and demonstrate that sure enough, what we measure in the laboratory is uh, what we're going to get in space or maybe even better. Um, so, um, so that, that, that's really what, what we're doing. And we are at technology readiness level between four and five. So we're very close to a, uh, to an actual flight, uh, to an actual flight engine. And once we deliver this engine, we become a commercial company that can essentially power any spacecraft that wants to do whatever work they want to do. I mean, we're interested in the logistics business of space. You know, to, be, to make space uh, sustainable, you, you need to have an infrastructure that is, that is also sustainable. And chemical rockets are not. It's just too much fuel. And so what you really want is, you know, you're building essentially the railroad that enables you to supply the moon, supply Mars, supply all the assets and the infrastructure that you got to maintain uh, so that there's a commercial, a, co a commercial capability. And that's what really is going to make humans uh, a spacefaring uh, species. So, okay. Well, so I know we have at least one billionaire that listens to this show occasionally, but if we have others, <laughs> please feel free to send your investments in because it's time to step up this process. Um, you can address them to Rod Pyle at P.O. Box. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we will be right back with our next. Tarek's got a burning question, and I say burning in quotes. We'll be right back with Tarek's next question after this short break. Stay with us. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden, the only open source cross-platform password manager anywhere, anytime. Security Now's Steve Gibson has even switched over, and that's saying something. With Bitwarden, all the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. 
In the summer 2023 G2 Enterprise Grid Report, they solidified their position as the highest performing password manager for the enterprise, leaving competitors in the dust. Bitwarden protects your data and privacy by adding strong randomly generated passwords for each and every account. And you can go further with the username generator and create unique usernames for each account or use any of the five integrated email alias services. You can transparently view all of Bitwarden's code, which is available on GitHub. On top of being public to the world, Bitwarden also has professional third-party audits performed yearly, and the results get published on their website. Bitwarden is open source security that you can trust. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is $3 per month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 per month per user. And individuals always get Bitwarden's basic free account for unlimited passwords. Upgrade any time to the premium account, as I did, for less than $1 a month. Or bring the whole family with the family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Also, Bitwarden just released their new passwordless SSO feature. SSO with trusted devices lets users log in to Bitwarden and decrypt their vault after using SSO on a registered trusted device. No master password needed. This new solution makes it even easier for enterprise users to stay safe and secure with Bitwarden. Learn more about SSO with trusted devices at bitwarden.com slash twit. You know, at Twit, we're fans of password managers. Get started with Bitwarden's free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. Well, uh, Rod, I think uh, hit the nail on the head when it comes to burning. You mentioned, Franklin, about the unsustainability of of chemical rockets. And uh, just because, I imagine, it's all of... It's a matter of mass, right? If you're going to have uh, big ships in space or, or ships in space for a long time, you have to fuel them. NASA's dealing with that now by trying to figure out how they're going to resupply and restock uh, a base around the moon with Gateway. But what is the fuel for a plasma rocket? Is it, is it water? Is it something else? Is it a pellet? Um, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you have to keep that going? Yeah, right now, um, the fuel that we use is argon gas. Oh, okay. it's, it's actually quite cheap. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about $5 a kilogram. And as compared to the competition that, uh, you know, the other electric rockets that are out there, they use uh, xenon. Xenon is a very expensive gas. It's mm -hmm. about $1,000 a kilogram. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference. So we're very interested in the u in, in, in simple, uh, very um, abundant fuels for deep space, Mars and, and beyond, we may use hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, hydrogen, uh, people say, well, it's really hard to store hydrogen in liquid form. And that, that is true, but not if you have a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor gives you electricity, which gives you a very good refrigeration and you can have oh. the hydrogen forever. So again, nuclear electric gives you the electric capability to do a lot of things that uh, you, you, you cannot do with nuclear thermal. And, and also, um, we're all considering the possibility of um, ammonia as a, as, a, as a way to store the hydrogen. Ammonia uh, is easy to store and, and it also contains, of course, nitrogen, NH3, so it contains nitrogen. And we may be able to use uh, ammonia as the fuel, uh, which has the properties of hydrogen, which give you the high specific impulse, and then the heavier molecule or the heavier atom of, of nitrogen, which gives you a little bit more thrust. So, you know, the Vasimir is an engine that can work with different propellants. We tune it, you know, we tune it to operate with these different propellants. And that, that's another one of the good features of it. You, you really want to establish a transportation capability where you can find fuel anywhere in the solar system that you go. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a, like a nice flexibility option if you get to pick and the, the gases that you're going to use. Sorry, Rod, go ahead. So this, <laughs> this pivots perfectly to my next question, because Tarek and I both wrote write for very broad audiences. And uh, I, frankly, I, I'm writing for myself a lot of the time. So one thing, one quote that constantly catches my attention about Vasimir is 
Mars in 39 days, right? Because we've been looking at Mars since Von Braun wrote the Mars Project and really before that, but he wrote the Mars Project in the late 40s, published in 53. We can make it to Mars in this many months and how hard can it be? Well, it turns out it's hard. And one of the reasons it's really hard is you've got people cooped up inside a small spacecraft, probably in microgravity for six, seven months at a time under chemical propulsion. When you start talking about a few weeks to Mars with a system like yours, suddenly not only does it become much more real, but then your mind begins to sort of start thinking about all the other places you can go and the other things you could do. So if we could sort of swing to the storyteller of Dr. Franklin for a moment, maybe you could kind of narrate to us a tour of the solar system with this propulsion system as you'd like to see it worked out in the next decade. Yeah. Well, that is true. Uh, Mars in 39 days is, is, has been fixated in people's minds uh, because we, we wanted to make it clear that we have um, the, the capability to go really fast. Uh, now, okay, there is no nuclear reactor in existence today that can provide the electricity in the proper way to, to a Vassimer engine to do a Mars in 39 days. So obviously we got a lot of homework to do. Uh, This is a challenge that uh, we should have taken on, you know, maybe 50 years ago. It it, it is, we we kind of are running out of time. So we need to develop the nuclear capability, the nuclear reactor, the the power conversion that is powerful enough and and, and lightweight enough to give you that that, uh, uh, performance. Okay, once you have that, yes, you have the entire solar system at, 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 your, at your disposal, in essence. And to me, um, the real interesting explora- exploration really is around the Jupiter and the Saturn system with uh, moons like uh, Ganymede and Europa, Titan uh, in, in Saturn. I mean, th- these are really interesting places uh, where we might even find life. We might even find, you know, uh, we know that there is liquid water in Europa. Maybe some of the other uh, large moons also uh, have oceans under their ice crust. So lots of really interesting stuff to do if we had the transportation to go there and do it quickly. That is that's the promise. So um, uh, we got to get get busy. We got to get this get this done. <laughs> I, I, I was I was thinking about the testing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I got I got distracted <laughs> thinking about testing. <laughs> so what um what's the first step, uh, Franklin, for testing it in space? I would assume you would put it on some kind of demonstration ship. But what kind of sh- is it just a satellite then that you would need or if you need that that big electrical thing would you look for something like a space station or whatnot i had i had heard that there were talks for the space station right now um we had talked we had talked years ago years ago i'm talking maybe 20 years ago about putting it on the space station and do a, a test a demonstration you know people get get confused with the power we say you know vasimir needs a lot of power okay that is true but um for a test, you don't need to have a large power source. All you need is a battery. Mm-hmm. You know, you could have a battery bank, and they got batteries now that are extremely capable. Um, and so we fire the engine for, you know, uh, half an hour uh, with a battery, and that that can be recharged, uh, trickle charged with a small solar array. Uh, so it's not something that is difficult. Um, right now, the space station option seems to not be that viable anymore. Um, we are considering a free flyer. Yeah. Just a simple free flyer with a, with a fairly inexpensive solar array package and a good battery uh, to do the demonstration. All we're looking for is to see that the performance in space is better or equal to what we see in the laboratory. That is our gateway to commercialization. Then at that point, yes, you can have to bring a solar array, which could give you maybe 300 kilowatts, 
and uh, solar arrays of 300 kilowatts are not, um, not, not, not a problem anymore. There used to be maybe 20 years ago, but not anymore. And now people are even talking about nuclear reactors. I mean, this Draco, this uh, Draco reactor is 200 kilo, uh, 200 megawatts, you know? So why can't we have a nuclear electric of the same scale? And I should point out that that Draco engine, that's a project between DARPA uh, and NASA uh, when we were talking about earlier. So um, yeah. yeah, people seem a lot more interested. When you mentioned that the space station is not really feasible, is that just because its days are numbered? I mean, it's got less than a decade left. No, no, actually, it's mo mostly a programmatic issue. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, uh, you know, there was a lot of resistance. Uh, people just didn't didn't believe that Vasimir would would uh, would perform the way it has performed. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, now we know, now we have the data and it shows that it can perform. Um, it's just uh, the nightmare of getting through the, the the bureaucracy of the space station program to get something <laughs> connected there. But it would have been beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful to. In fact, in my last flight, uh, I was uh, uh, doing a spacewalk uh, on the space station, and I was thinking. I even went to look at the place where I would put the rocket. That's. <laughs> I, I made a little mark in there, and then <laughs> <laughs> we got a we got a photo of that spacewalk and line line thirty eight. That's that's yeah, but I want to see a picture of, of where he made the hash mark. Mount here, it's, it's little, right here. Yeah, because uh, actually it was going to go on the top of the Z one truss, mm -hmm. and we already had worked out uh, the electrical connections and how the the space station. Uh, was able to provide a very small amount of power. It was about a kilowatt, a kilowatt and a half of trickle charging uh, power to charge a battery pack. And uh, that was going to be sufficient to do the test. And, um, but it, you know, the programmatic just uh, didn't, didn't work out. Uh, it, it just, it was just became too, too hard to do programmatically, not technically, programmatically. So, so I, I've heard that there's a bit of a bureaucracy at NASA, but I always assume, no, I think, no. as a foolish you surely layman, you jest, Rod. <laughs> I assume that if you flew the shuttle seven times, if you helped build and repair the space station, and if you were the director of the Advanced Space Propulsion Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center, that you could just swipe your card key, walk in, go up to some of your old pals and say, hey, let's make this happen. Are you telling me it's not that easy? Well, yeah, <laughs> you and me together. Uh, yes, uh, I, I tell you, I tried. Uh, I had the Space Act agreements signed. I had mm. uh, all kinds of collaborative agreements. Uh, and it just dragged on and on and dragged and and, and it got to the point where it was just in the in the too hard category and you know like they say that the definition of madness is to keep doing the same thing and right. expecting a different result so, so i figure well it's much better to just try to do a, a free flyer even though i may not be able to go and ref refurbish it or fix it just in case it doesn't work um, I'll put enough redundancy in the system just to make sure that uh, I minimize the, the probability of failure. So that's what we're trying to do now. So we're, we're going to go to a break in a moment, but just real quick, if you talk about a free flyer, how, how much mass, what size would that be? Is this a small unit or does it need to be something very large? It's a small, it's a small unit. It's a, a small unit, maybe, um, maybe two, uh, one and a half to two tons maximum. It's totally doable within conventional launchers, uh, and you just pay for the for the ride to to, to low Earth orbit where you can do the test. Okay, so Tarek, we need to start taking up a collection at the end of every episode. <laughs> um, we will be right back with our next question after this short break. Don't go anywhere. So, as a result of of Tarek and I being the enthusiastic souls we are, we've gotten this far without talking about your shuttle years because. What you're doing now is so exciting, but I think it's really important, uh, if we could, to take a quick turn and talk a little bit about your views on the on the environment and climate change. Yeah. Um, you're in addition to everything else you do, you're an educator and kind of a, a chief inspirer for people both here in the U.S. and in other countries. And I assume 
you know, most of us had some environmental awareness. I mean, you and I are almost the same age. I was born in 56, ha- had some environmental awareness, certainly after the mid to late sixties, right? Earth day and the Apollo eight photograph, earth rise and all that. So stuff. So that certainly got us aware, but then you go into space and you look back at earth over and over again. And the term, the overview effect floats into mind. How did this come to you and how has it been transformative? And what do you want to say to people about it? Well, I think it has been transformative. Um, I think in the end, we are all astronauts. And, and that's kind of the way I think. I think. Uh, and to, to, to an astronaut, the most important system of your spacecraft it's not, it's not the propulsion system or the electrical system. It's the life support system. That is the most important thing, mm. because if that doesn't work, you know, you die. Um, and we are, in essence, you know, damaging the life support system of our, of our spacecraft, uh, you know, the, the Earth. We, for, you know, thousands of years, you know, have considered the the environment as a, as a, as a bottomless pit, you know, right. where we, 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 we can dump all of our waste and it disappears. But I think this in the, in the 21st century, we have now come to realize that the, 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 the pit uh, has a bottom and that not only that, but it has overflowed and we are now confronted with our own waste. And I think that we have to do something now because we are damaging the planet to the point that it cannot sustain the weight of humanity. Humanity continues to grow, yet the resources of the planet are, are threatened uh, more and more. And that's why we see all these migrations and all these changes of, you know, people are moving around because they want to go places where life is better. You know, the planet is, uh, is unsuitable for life in certain areas and, and, and people have to move. That's, you know, that's the logical thing. So that's why we're seeing all this, all these migrations. And I think that sooner or later, <clears throat> we will, um, humans will be living somewhere else. Uh, most, uh, most of humanity will be outside of the earth. Uh, and we will, you know, explore other other places but we have to have uh, a healthy planet to be able to explore our society has to be healthy and you know otherwise we'll be always trying to survive and we won't have time to ex- to, to 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 explore space so to me the uh, space program and what we're doing now is urgent and and it's urgent that we pay attention that that we are really damaging the the only spacecraft that we that we have this is the story that every astronaut will tell you i think i think we're completely in agreement with you know all the people who have flown in space come back with the same story is is that something that like as as an educator at rice university you teach the students as well uh, uh franklin that that um that responsibility uh, as well as, I guess, managing, managing the risk of your own future, right? Cause that's, we have a future in space where astronauts have to manage risk and whatnot, but we've got, we've got a planet here. We've got to take care of too. It sounds like. Yeah. It's all connected. Yeah. It's all connected. Uh, what we're doing in space is kind of, uh, enabling the survival of the human race. I mean, there's nothing less. That's why we're exploring space so that we can survive. And, um, but if we if we damage the environment to such an extent that we cannot explore, then we basically are sealing our fate. Uh, 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 we're going to die, and nobody will care, not because nobody will be able to tell the story. Yeah, because there will there will be no more humans, and you know the universe doesn't care. Uh, you know, in the in the cosmic context of of the universe, it doesn't matter whether the earth is inhabited or not. I mean, the earth is not fragile. It's, it's us who, who are the fragile. And it doesn't really matter if we're, a good point. you know, it doesn't really matter if we are inhabiting the earth or not. Uh, the earth doesn't care. 
but we do, you know, we care. So, so that to me is, is, is the, the fundamental uh, issue that we need to confront ourselves um, with is, is, is nothing less than survival. I did want to ask, um, and this is, a, I apologize for the subject change, but I did want to ask because um, you didn't fly once or twice. You flew seven times on the space shuttle, um, which is a lot, I think, just in general for most astronauts might get one flight, uh, maybe a couple, um, but seven in some of these missions. I mean, you flew with uh, Senator Nelson, who is now, of course, NASA chief and Charlie Bolden, who became NASA chief. I'm wondering, Franklin, when it's your turn. <laughs> then, right from that flight to become NASA chief, you helped. Deploy We're lobbying the, for it. Right. <laughs> right? The, the Galileo spacecraft, right, was is is on this list. Um, that crazy idea for a tether, which you know, uh, sci-fi folks have been talking about, uh, 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 you know, for for years. And and there's just so many amazing missions here. A trip to to Mir. It looks like if if mm -hmm. if I'm reading this right. That's right. Um, which means that you visited two space stations, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many people did that? <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm just wondering if, I mean, from that list, and it's, it's, I mean, if, if that means that you could fly every day of a week if you stack them all in one, uh, uh, one after another, if there's one um, that is the most dear to you or that was the most challenging, three spacewalks at the space station in 2002, um, and, and those are no picnic. Uh, it just seems like you did everything that an astronaut can or would ever do all in like these seven missions themselves well uh the first flight is always the one that stays with you you know i i used to play astronaut when i was a little kid uh, we used to have a big cardboard box and you know a couple of chairs inside the box and we would you know lay there in the back and go through a countdown and you know, launch into <laughs> space and, and, um, and when I was, uh, you know, getting ready to launch, uh, on, on the Columbia on, on my first flight, I thought to myself, I, you know, I've done this before. I, 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 I remember, you know, <laughs> it's just, it's, this is just like it was. And, and, you know, to me, the first flight was the most impactful personally, because it's when you experience, you know, the sen sen sensory, you know, max, uh, uh, sen sensory um, stimulation to the max of, of getting into space. First time, you know, you float and you get up there. The first thing, you know, you unstrap. The first thing you want to do is, is look out the window. Just go look out out the window and, and what you see is, is the most beautiful thing that you ever saw. And it just stays in your brain. And every time I flew, I would reinforce that. It's almost like you, you learn to taste uh, a, a meal that uh, has many flavors, and, but you, you couldn't taste them all because they, they all came to you <laughs> at once. And then in the second flight, you get to taste uh, a little bit different, something that you didn't pick up on the first one. And then the, on the third flight, you, you taste a little bit more. So it's almost like you get much more um, uh, aware of what's, of what's going on. And, the, uh, and the, the, the sensations are much more profound. And, and then the spacewalks, of course, yeah. uh, I had an opportunity when in, in one of my spacewalks, uh, I was uh, up on top of the end of the arm and we went into the, 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 the nighttime and it, it so happens that we were flying over the, the Pacific um, and, and there was a, a, a huge uh, aurora uh, and we flew oh. right through it and I was immersed in the aurora um oh, wow. you know and i just couldn't believe that i was experiencing this you know as a plasma physicist i mean that is like incredible to to see that you're in you're in a plasma environment sitting you know out in space and and so yeah i just uh, i've been extremely fortunate um, to have had so much uh given to me everything 
given to me by a nation that is my adopted land. You know, uh, you know, a land that I love and and that um, I would die for. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I I am so so grateful. Uh, yeah, that that's amazing. So yeah. grateful. Whew. Hold on. <laughs> I got to wipe it eye here. That was quite a statement. And the vision of, of you flying through uh, what effectively is kind of an orbital rainbow. I mean, what what a moment to take with you the rest of your life. I mean, my big moment will probably be remembering, you know, buying my first new car or something. And for you, it's one of your seven flights, which apparently did not get blasé, no matter how many times you launched on the shuttle, <laughs> flying through an auroral field. That's That's astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. Tarek, you got anything well, else? You know, I had one. I don't want to end on a downer, but I, 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 I was looking at this repertoire of missions, Franklin, and I, I couldn't help but notice that your your first flight, uh, 61C, you know, launched in, on, in January of, of, of 86, which, you know, early January, and, and later that, that month was, of course, the, the tragedy of Columbia. And that first flight was all, or pardon me, the, the tragedy of, of, of Challenger. And mm-hmm. then you flew on Columbia, and in 2003, a year after your final flight, you know, Columbia is lost too. And there's clear risks yeah. uh, uh, for space flight there. And I'm just curious how you manage that and how you see astronauts today managing that as we have new vehicles going forward, hopefully eventually powered by a Vasmir engine to, sure. to get to yeah. Mars. Yeah. Um, and because that service that that hasn't gone away, but clearly it's something that you faced on a as as a part of your work. And, and I'm just wondering how you how you approach that. What what you know your students or future astronauts should take away from that going forward? Yeah. Well, obviously you want to minimize the risk, and you want to manage uh, whatever you you know you you cannot understand, and try to manage around it. Um, it was really hard on the family. You know, us, you know, we are having the time of our lives, you know, we are, you know, getting launched into space, adrenaline flowing. It's just, you know, you don't have time to think too much about, you know, whether you're going to die or not. Um, But the families are just watching and, and, and feeling for you. And, you know, you, you could, you could disappear um, as it has happened. So I think it was more difficult, much more difficult on, on the families. I, I know my mother really had a hard time every time I, I, I flew. Uh, my children, uh, some probably did. Uh, they don't say very much. They don't speak very much about that. But I do know that the family um, suffers. Uh, we were, our flight, uh, our, our 61C crew had been assigned to the Challenger flight. Uh, a few months before we moved to the Columbia flight earlier. So all of us moved except for one. One of our crew members was uh, Greg Jarvis, uh, who stayed on the, on, on, on the Challenger. And of course he, he, he perished on, on that flight. So it, it, was, it was very hard for us to, to, to see this. Uh, obviously everybody else had a hard time, but it, for, for us it was, it was very difficult. And for me personally, I lost um, a really dear friend, you know, Mike Smith, uh, the, the co-pilot, the, the pilot in that, in that flight. Uh, he and I were very close friends. And I, um, that day, I had called him um, to wish him a good flight. And, uh, and I, you know, we talked for a little while and, and you know, I told him, Mike, uh, you know, it's going to be great. You're going to really, you know, space is wonderful. And it was a really great conversation. And then he died. And from that point on, I never, ever call any astronaut before they fly. Yeah. I, I'm not a, a you know, um, I don't think about premonitions or anything like that, uh, but I just cannot do it. I cannot get myself to do it. They, they say that when we lost the Challenger, we lost our innocence. 
often oftentimes that expression comes up. Mm -hmm. And when I flew my second flight uh, after Challenger, I, I went there with a different mindset, mm -hmm. it, almost like, um, I guess when you go to battle and you come back with a few uh, wounds and you, you know, you, you take care of your wounds, but just the scars still hurt. And then you go back and, and you're more careful. It's more sovereign, more, you think more about what you're going to do. Yeah. So you got to manage, you got to manage the risk and we will lose other people. I'm sure that, uh, you know, accidents will, will happen, especially going to Mars. That's why I want to have a propulsion system that is very robust. We don't want to go uh, in a, a very fragile, you know, mission configuration that uh, something goes wrong. You're going to watch that crew die for months and months, you know, yeah. and there's nothing you can do about it. And, and that's, that's just not the way we want to play this game. Yeah. Well, but, so <laughs> for a closing comment, I wonder, this is sort of a pivot here, but uh, what would you say to young people in the U S young people around the world who maybe might might follow your path to come to the U.S. Or, or stay where they are since this is becoming a much more international uh, situation than it's ever been before. I mean, when we look what's happening with China and India, my gosh, they're, they're making great strides. So I'm looking for your, your sort of big comment about the future for young people and maybe not so young people because people can change careers now and move into the space area where they haven't before. Yeah. Well, space... It has become a place of business, you know, and that is uh, a very strong incentive to move lots of people. I, I, I think space makes sense if everyone can go, not just selected astronauts from this or that country. No, I think space needs to be open to the entire planet, to the whole of humanity. And it is a place of business. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made and the profit motive is a very strong incentive to enable humans to really, truly become a, you know, cosmic, a cosmic, uh, you know, um, uh, civilization. And I think far into the future, I think the earth, um, will eventually become if we if we do it right the earth uh, will become essentially a national park huh. you know uh, a protected area of humanity uh, a beautiful place where people from you know many different corners of of, of, of the solar system maybe maybe even the galaxy i don't know um, will be able to come back to see where the their ancestors came from and it will be a nice place to be and a beautiful healthy planet that's the future that i would like to to see happen and but we got to get busy that's right we got to get busy a, co oh a cosmic gosh, a, a cosmic civilization not just multi-planetary cosmic. cosmic i like it i love yeah. it so from our mouths to jeff bezos's ears uh, franklin i i Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been our conversation with Franklin Chang Diaz, astronaut educator, and the closest thing to Zephram Cochran we're likely to see in this <laughs> lifetime. And Ant, for you, that's a Star Trek reference, not for sports. Uh, Franklin, where can we where, where can we keep up with uh, your latest developments? Well, our web page obviously is uh, is we we continue to put our stuff in there, so. Uh, at astrorocket.com is okay. our as our web web uh, page and um, please be paying attention we're we're going to make history here okay Tarek, i think you and i need to update the articles in our respected publications that's right we got to get ready we got to speak you of Tarek, where can we track your numberless achievements these days sir well well uh as always at space.com where we're going to be tracking the return of osiris rex over the coming weekend so please tune in you can watch it all live on uh the 24th as we're recording this on the twitter at Tarek j malik and if you like sporadic video games you can find oh, me on God. youtube 
at Spacetron Place. So <laughs> I can't believe you said it in public. And of course, you can always find me at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. That's T W I S at twit.tv. We always welcome your comments, suggestions, ideas, and even the occasional critical remark. And we answer each and every uh, message that we get. Also, don't forget to check out space.com, the websites of the name, and the National Space Society at nss.org, both of which are good places to satisfy your spaceflight cravings. New episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. We'll take five stars or a thumbs up or just a, a happy nod. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free at Club Twit, as well as some extras that are only available there. And I, I won't say again about Tarek falling off his chair, but things like that for just $7 <laughs> a month. And it's, it's worth it just for that or for the giggle fit we had last week. Finally, you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter slash X and on Facebook and Twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you next week. Oh, hey, that's a really nice iPhone you have there. You totally picked the right color. Hey, since you do use an iPhone and maybe use an iPad or an Apple Watch or an Apple TV, well, you should check out iOS Today. It's a show that I, Micah Sargent, and my co-host Rosemary Orchard host every Tuesday right here on the Twit Network. It covers all things iOS, tvOS, HomePod OS, Watch OS, iPad OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer. And we love to give you tips and tricks about making the most of those devices, checking out great apps and services, and answering your tech questions. I hope you check it out.